Open your Bibles up to Mark chapter 11. This morning we're going to finish up our series looking at the parables of Jesus. In the coming weeks we'll look at the theme of thanksgiving and worship and praise. Um, but I, I wanted to wrap up with this particular parable for a reason. Remember that a parable is a, is a story that is given alongside something that's going on in real life to teach spiritual truth. It's to take something that may be abstract in the kingdom of God or in the mind of God and make it concrete by giving us an example that we can feel or touch or experience. And I hope that as we've gone through this series of looking at the, par the, the parables, that you've been able to really grasp God's heart for the lost, or to gain a, maybe you've gained a clearer understanding of His heart for the church. I hope that you've grown in your love for the Lord and for the people that He's made through this study. But one of the really helpful things about the parables are that sometimes they provide for us a summary. Summaries are, you know, where they take some big concept and they kind of boil it down to all of its really simple, basic parts. Summaries are really, really helpful. Do you remember back in school, perhaps your teacher would be explaining some concept of, you know, I don't know, molecular biology. I don't know what classes you took, see? And then, you know, you're, you're totally lost. And then they say something that you're like, oh, I get that. Why don't you just start with the summary? Why don't you just give me that in the beginning? Anybody ever been there? Fantastic. Sometimes summaries are really helpful. But sometimes a summary could fail to deliver, right? The way we might summarize some of our favorite movies, Lord of the Rings, a group of nine guys spend hours returning jewelry. <laughs> That's a summary, it's accurate, but it fails to deliver. Star Wars, a talking frog convinces a son to kill his father. That's Yoda, the talking frog. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. A lunatic enslaves chocolate-making entertainers and slowly kills children in front of their parents. That's an accurate summary! But it, it fails to deliver, doesn't it? These summaries fall short of communicating the plot of those movies. But the passage that we see this morning, I, I want you to think of it when we get to chapter 12 as the Bible in 12 verses. The plan of God, God's redemptive plan summarized in a parable about a vineyard. It's a parable that summarizes God's redemptive plan for sinful people, and it's a parable that doesn't fall short of communicating the plot. we got to start in chapter 11 so we have some background. Mark chapter 11, verse 27. Then they came again to Jerusalem, and he was talking, and he was walking in the temple with the chief priests. The scribes and the elders came to him, and they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one question, and then to me, and I will tell you about what authority I do these things. The baptisms of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And they reason among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, they feared the people, for all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus answered and said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. This all takes place on what would have been the Tuesday of the week that Christ was crucified. It's called the Passion Week. Just days before this, Jesus went into the temple and he noticed that they were using the temple as a way of exploiting people. People would come to the temple and they, were, they would come and they would bring a sacrifice. And these guys would sit there and grade the quality of their sacrifice. And if it wasn't up to par, they would say, you know, this one's not good enough. The good news is for you. I can sell you one that is good enough. They had taken the temple of God, which was to be a house of prayer, 
and made it into a den of thieves. Anybody remember what Jesus does? He doesn't, he doesn't deal kindly with this. He brings the whip, turns the tables over, spills their money boxes, and chases them out of the temple. The people who are in a position to profit from this illegal business in the temple now begin to look for a way to destroy Jesus. So Jesus goes back on Tuesday, the week he's betrayed. He goes back into Jerusalem, and apparently these guys have regained their composure. And they question him clearly, and they say, By what authority? What gives you the right to come in and turn over our tables and chase us out? By what authority have you done this? Jesus is not about to be trapped by this question. So he asks them a simple question in return concerning John the Baptist. All they have to do is tell Jesus what authority that John operated under, and he will tell them the authority that he has. Jesus knew what authority that John operated under, right? Because John operated under his authority. Jesus under, operated under the same power, the power of God. But Jesus knew these guys would never admit it. So these religious leaders clearly demonstrate their hypocrisy. They're seeking an answer that made them look good. But there is no answer where they can stay in the positive in terms of public perception. If they say that John is sent from God, they have to admit they're wrong. If they say that John was just a man and not a prophet sent by God, everyone's going to turn against them. Jesus exposes their motives. He exposes their hypocrisy. They rejected the message of John. Just like their fathers had persecuted every other prophet that came before them. Now instead of owning that, and instead of going, you know what, we were wrong about God. They choose the non-answer. Isn't that a bit of cowardice? We're wrong, but we're too afraid to admit it. And Jesus could have allowed the matter to die right there, right? He could have been like, yeah, see? Mess with me, I'll ask you a question. But he doesn't. He ups the ante. He takes it further. He uses this as an opportunity to expose the religious leaders for the hypocrites that they were. And the parable that follows in chapter 12, he exposes the sinfulness of these religious Jews and he exalts the majesty of Almighty God by summarizing God's plan. Yet in it, we see the role of these religious leaders in that plan. Verse 12. Uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Earlier, Frank read from Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5 is clearly in reference. It's almost quoted in what Jesus says here. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 5 one more time. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted with it the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So we expected it to bring forth good grapes. We could read the whole thing and we get to this point where we understand that we're not talking about an ordinary vineyard. What are we talking about? Let's go to verse 3. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem. This vineyard in this parable it's not a vineyard. It's a nation. It's the people of Israel. It's the people of God. 
When Jesus gives this parable, he's, he's quoting this passage, and we see very clearly in this passage that this vineyard is the nation of Israel. This parable depicts a man that did everything necessary to build and to cultivate a beautiful and fruitful vineyard. He did everything. He removed the obstacles to it growing. He protected it. He built the wall. He watered it. We see in Isaiah 5, this is, again, it's, it's so clear. It's a picture of the Jewish nation. It's Israel. The parable begins... This parable summarizing God's redemptive plan begins with this nation that's been planted. That would be point number one if you're taking notes. A nation planted. God tenderly raised up this vine, Israel, in a land called Egypt. He took that vine, he transported it across the burning sands of the Sinai Peninsula, he planted it in Canaan, it took root there and it flourished. God gave the vine a good land where it would grow. He, he gave these people His Word. He gave these people His protection. By God's own testimony in Isaiah verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 4, which we already read, what more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? God did everything to make it possible for these people to flourish and to prosper and to fill, fulfill every plan He had for them. But, we see a little bit of a different result than what we might expect out of me. Before we move there, let me ask you this question. Was God good to Israel? Amen. Yeah? Did He protect them? Did He provide for them? Did He rescue them? Did He preserve their lives time and time again? Should Israel have loved him and been devoted to him in return? Yeah. Has God been good to you? Everyone in this room should be able to confess that God has been good to them. Especially if you know the Lord. Especially if you've been saved. If you're a Christian. It's, because, it's like he's brought you out of your own personal Israel, where you were enslaved to your sin. <coughs> and He's given you eternal life in Christ. Just like He brought these people out of slavery in Egypt and, and brought them into the promised land and blessed them and cared for them and gave them life. That's what He's done for us. The response that we might expect from Israel would just be devotion and praise to God. Now, if that's the expectation we would have of them, should we not also expect that that's where our hearts are concerning the Lord? That we love Him and are devoted to Him. That, that with all that we are, we would praise Him, like we see in Psalm 150, verse 6. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's continue to verse 2 in our text. Now at vintage time, he sent his servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent them another servant. And at him they threw stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully treated. And again he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. So this nation of Israel is planted, they begin to prosper, God does everything necessary for them to thrive and to flourish. Remember that in this parable, the landowner is God. The vineyard is Israel. Who are the vine dressers? Who are the ones that have been tasked with managing? Who other than the very Pharisees that Jesus is talking to? The vine dressers represent the religious leaders, and now we're introduced to these men 
that the landowner sends as representative, representatives of himself to interact with the farmers, the prophets, the judges, the men that God would use to speak into the lives of Israel and, and their leaders when they would turn away from the Lord. This section of the parable is designed to speak to the religious leaders of Israel. They've been entrusted with the spiritual well-being of this nation. And time and time again, they lead the people astray. God, in His infinite and wonderful grace, sends them prophets, sends them judges, sends them other holy men and women who would lead them back into the way they should go. And each time, God would send such a person over and over again, Israel refused to hear the message. These are those who came to the Hebrew people and spoke God's truth to them. Men like Isaiah, Jeremiah, David, Samson, Ezekiel, Samuel, people that God would use to proclaim His truth to the nation. Some were beaten, some were chased away, some were killed, they were rejected. John the Baptist was beheaded. Yet God in His grace kept sending them. Isn't that consistent with how the Lord relates to us? How many times has the Lord done something to get your attention? You've been going in a direction you should not go. You've been walking where you should not walk. And the Lord puts someone or something in your path. And you're like, yeah, I know. I should, I should, I should do things the Lord's way. I should, I should return to the Lord. My, my, my heart and my mind should be focused on Him. And, we, and instead of turning, we just reject that person. And we push that person away. Or we push that truth to the side. And because we... Because we want to reject it. How many times has the Lord reached out to you to turn your heart and life back to Him? And maybe it's not come in the form of a person. He sent Israel prophets. Maybe it's the creation itself. You see, the reality is, is a lot of times you're like, well, no one ever told me. Well, that's unlikely. But let's say it's true. Let's say, you know, no one ever told me. No one ever warned me. I never heard. I've got a good excuse. Well, let's hold on there for a second. Psalm 19, 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day it utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Who could say they haven't heard the message when creation itself testifies of who God is and how we should live in response to Him? Then we go, well, what about the Aborigines on Boingo Boingo who never hear the name of Jesus? <coughs> Romans 1.20, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Is there any excuse? When we take Scripture seriously, is there any excuse for us to not turn our hearts back to the Lord? I'm pretty sure it says we're without excuse. And the reason I'm pretty sure it says that is because I just read it. The people who go, I don't like your interpretation, Dan. I, I didn't interpret it. I quoted it. It says it in plain language. They're without excuse. The reality is, is that every person ever born in the history of the world that can make a moral decision is without excuse for not worshiping God as He ought to be worshipped. We have enough knowledge of God in the creation of it, in the creation itself, that we are condemned for not worshiping Him. The problem is, they have enough knowledge to be condemned, but they don't have enough knowledge to be saved, which is why we need to tell them about Jesus. 
Jesus comes to the Pharisees and he turns this question back on them. He tells them that they turned his house, the temple, into a den of thieves. And they respond, what gives you the right to tell us how to live? But how many times do we see clearly in nature and in Scripture where our lives are in conflict with the truth that God has made evident? And we ask the same thing. Jesus, what gives you the right to tell me how to live? Isn't that the ultimate excuse that it always comes back to? I don't want to be told how to live. I want to be the one in charge. I want to be my own boss. I want to do things my way. What? Authority do you have to command me? That's what they ask Jesus, and that's the excuse of the heart of every person living in rebellion to God. I want to do it my way. So let's ask the question who owns the vineyard again? Wait a minute, who owns the vineyard again? God made the world and everything in it. It belongs to Him. We belong to Him. You belong to Him. Therefore, you are accountable to Him. And He does have the right to tell us how to live. Time after time, messengers are sent to this nation, to Israel. Time after time, they reject, stone, kill, send away the prophets. Now let's just let's just think about this just real practically and, and try to capture the heart of God in what we think. If you had a business, if this was an actual vineyard, and you owned a vineyard, and you hired people to run it for you, and it's harvest time, and you send a representative, you send someone else, and you say, it's harvest time, and they beat up your guy, and they send him away empty-handed, and you get none of the profit from the property you own. What happens to those people you hired? They get fired right now. Why keep sending messengers? Why keep sending them prophets? Why not just get rid of them? Why not just cut them off? Why not just destroy them? He has every right. Here we see the love and the patience of God. 2 Peter 3 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some count slackness but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's the why. God does not want them to perish. He wants them to change. He wants them to repent. He desires that for us as well. So this nation is planted. The prophets are rejected. And then we get to verses 6 through 8. Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, They will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the The landowners, the landowner, the farmer, God, sends representative after representative. They're all rejected. Finally, he sends his own son. The religious leaders kill the son and they throw him out of the vineyard. Do you see what Jesus is communicating here? Remember what I told you at the beginning? This is the Bible in 12 verses. This is a summary of God's redemptive plan. If you still think we're talking about an actual vineyard, somebody farming table grapes, that train left the station. Jesus is telling these men beforehand what they were already plotting in secret to do. 
He's exposing the condition of their own hearts to them. He makes it clear to them that he has absolute authority in the vineyard because he is the son. He is the heir. It's his vineyard. Remember the question? Whose authority? Who says you get to command what goes on in the temple? And he gives them this parable. And in it, this heir comes. And they don't listen to him. They kill him. Do you think the hair stood up on the back of their necks a little bit? Mm -hmm. I see no. Don't worry about it. Let's just kill him anyway. The Pharisees, the leaders of the Jews, thought that by killing the son, they could have the vineyard to themselves. The religious men would never admit it, but they saw themselves as little gods. They loved feeling in control. They wanted to run the show. They wanted everything for themselves. They wanted the wealth and the prestige and the authority. And the thought of sharing it with anybody, oh, that would just, that would just be intolerable, right? Especially sharing it with some uneducated carpenter from Nazareth. Oh, never. So instead they kill him. I've seen this time and time again in 13 years of ministry. Men and women refuse to acknowledge Jesus as Lord because they can't stomach the idea that God is in control and they're not. They hold so tightly to this idea, I'm in control, I'm in control. It's my life, it's my vineyard. They hold it so tightly their hands aren't open enough to receive the blessings that God has for them otherwise. What I've found time and time again is that people want heaven on their own terms. Let me ask you a question. Do you want heaven or do you want Christ? Do you want heaven more than you want Christ? Just let that like kind of marinate in your mind. Do you want heaven or do you want Christ? Because here's the thing. A lot of people want heaven. And we want heaven on our terms. And so when, when we're pursuing heaven, we get legalism. We get works righteousness. We get the same dead religion of the Pharisees. And it doesn't work. And we're lost and we're condemned in a sin. Because the Bible says it's by grace we're saved through faith and not works. And when we're pursuing heaven by our own means to obtain it, we lose it. We miss it. And we don't get it. But what if instead we pursued Christ? When what we want is Christ, when what we pursue is Christ, when what we get is Christ, we get all the blessings of heaven too. His death pays for our sin. His death wipes our slate clean. And the grace He offers makes us heirs with Him. When you get the Son, you become a joint heir with Christ. When you get the Son, you get all the blessings that heaven has to offer. And the Pharisees miss out on that to their own device. Let's, let's not make that mistake. Here's the thing. If you have everything in the world, but you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. But if you have nothing in this world except Jesus, you have everything that matters. John 10, 28. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Can I ask you, what would be more valuable than eternal life? What in this world is so important to hold on to, to control, or to like trick ourselves into believing we have control over that is worth more than eternal life that God is willing and able to give us if we just let go and go, Lord, you're in control. 
Can I tell you this as well? We squeeze so tightly to hold on to that sense of, I'm in control, I'm the boss, I'm the one running the show, I'm the one running me. One day, he will pry your fingers open and take that sense of control away. I'm going to tell you now, it hurts a lot less to realize you don't have control anyway and trust him with it than for him to pry your fingers open and take it from you. But he will, because he's God. I want to spend a little more time here before we move on to the next point. Have you ever been given like an amazing gift, an extravagant gift? Like just like what, how? Like, I mean, wow! Just think about that. The best gift you've ever been given. By definition, a gift is something you don't earn. If you earn it, it's not a gift, it's pain. The grace of God is a gift. You can't earn it. If you earn it, it's not a gift. It's not grace. But here's the thing. We read scripture and it becomes pretty clear. If we got what we earned, if we got what we deserved, we would be dead and in hell now. But we're not, are we? We're all still on the right side of the grave, standing up straight, breathing. You're not dead. That all by itself is an amazing gift. It's a gift from God that we don't deserve. We, we're on the right side of the dirt, and by His grace, we're breathing this morning. By His grace, we're gathered together this morning. By His grace, we can still hear His truth and read it this morning. And it's that same grace that calls us to come to Him for salvation. And here's the awesome thing. We see Him do it with the nation of Israel time and time again. He sends prophet after prophet after prophet. He sends representative after representative. He extends His grace. He extends His grace. We reject it. We refuse it. He extends it some more. He keeps calling and He keeps drawing until we come to Him. Isn't that how you came to know the Lord? Do you see yourself in this text? We are the people who rejected the message of God. We are the, we are the people who have rejected the prophets of God. We are the people who crucified the Lord because it was for our sin that He died until... Until he won. Until we stopped rejecting it. Until we received his grace. Until we recognized we're not in control. And, we, and we, we come to the end of ourselves and we go, man, what kind of God would keep extending his love to me? I'm so undeserving. What kind of God would, would send His Son to die in my place? I'm so undeserving. And instead of continuing to reject it, we, we receive it and we return it to Him in the form of our praise. This is the Bible in 12 verses. Yet still, so many times and far too often, we are like the Jewish leaders who reject the Son in favor of ourself because we want to feel like we're in control. If you are not saved, run to Him. Call on the name of Jesus. He is your only hope. If you are saved, develop an attitude and a lifestyle of genuine worship for the God of grace who sent His Son to die for you even after you rejected Him over and over again. The fact that you have air in your lungs this morning proves it's not too late. So the Lord of the vineyard 
response. Remember, he's established this nation. He's planted it. He's built it from nothing. They reject the prophets. They kill the son. And now he comes a little bit differently. It's interesting in the text it says, at last, the last one he sends is his son. If we reject Christ, there is nothing else other than his wrath. And that's what we see in the text. These prophet, these these represent, or excuse me, these vineyard workers, the Pharisees, they kill the son. And so we see him come to wrath to destroy those that have taken what belongs to him, and he gives it to others. In that, we see the church established. Verses 9 through 12. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Follow me here. In this passage, this is the summary of the establishing of the church that we're gathered in and part of today. It's not just here in Stony Ford, it's all around the world. There's Christians gathered all around the world this morning because Christ established it. Let's look at the progression. Israel as a nation is established by God to represent them on earth, to be a light to other nations. They reject God. They rejected every attempt God made to call them back to Himself. They abuse and they kill His messengers time and time again. John the Baptist, the, the servant that God sent most recently prior to Jesus, is beheaded and rejected. And now they determine in their hearts to destroy the very Son of God, the people He's speaking to. By His miracles and by His message, Jesus had clearly demonstrated to the Jews that He is in fact the Messiah. He is God in flesh. Yet these men want the vineyard for themselves. They want control over Israel. They want control over the religion. They want to be the ones that get to decide who gets in and who, who doesn't get into heaven. So they kill him. Just like we see in this parable, Jesus is pushed out of the city onto Calvary Mountain and he is murdered there. He's killed on a hill outside of Jerusalem just like the sun is killed outside of the vineyard. But it's interesting that when we get to verses 9-12 through 12, Jesus changes the imagery, doesn't he? He stops talking about a vineyard. He starts talking about a building. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. It's interesting that within a few years of Jesus speaking these words, Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple is torn down. And all of that tearing down and all of that destruction, something else is established. Re remember that Jerusalem, Israel, the nation of Israel, these are, this is supposed to be the representatives of God on the earth, and it's torn down. Yet, yeah. Ephesians 2, 19-22, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone, and whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, and whom you are also being built for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. The church is the temple. The church is the dwelling place of God. 
the church, the people of God, indwelled by the Holy Spirit. We are God's representatives on earth. He's taken it away from the vine dressers, and He's established it, and He's built it from everyone who would come to Him by faith. It's the church that stands as the representative of God on earth. My friends, this is the Bible in 12 verses. This is a summary of God's plan of redemption. This is it. So many today want to make it more complicated. They're looking for the next prophet or the next big move or the next book to be written or we're going to add some extra thing that we think is missing from this. This is it. There's no more prophets that we should be expecting. This isn't in your notes and it's not on the screen. Hebrews 1 says, in, in, in days ago he spoke by prophets and through dreams and visions, but now, in these latter days, he's spoken to us by his Son. In the passage that we just read, it says, at last, the last one he sends is his Son. The summary of God's plan of redemption is right here. The church is established to worship the Lord and proclaim the gospel until the ends of the earth, until Jesus comes back. And that's it. Hebrews 2, 1 through 3, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Is there any escape if we neglect this? If we look to something other than what we, we have right here, this, this summary of what we just see, is there anything other than the plan of God He makes so plain? How will we escape if we neglect it? We won't. Here's what you need to know. Let me just cut down to the summary of the summary, the bottom line of the bottom line. One day you will stand before Jesus Christ. You will either face Him as your Savior or you will face Him as your judge. When Jesus finishes the parable, the Jews wanted to arrest Him and deal with Him once and for all, but they're too afraid to do anything because the people respected Jesus as a great rabbi. However, these Jewish leaders hated him and they wanted him dead and they confirmed it in their rejection of Jesus. And Jesus is confirmed in his judgment of them. He says it plainly. He sends his son and you're going to kill him. They know who they're plotting to kill. They're plotting to kill the one standing before them. And instead of going, oh my goodness, you're right. How did we miss it? They go, yeah, yeah, let's kill him. And he's absolutely justified in his judgment on them. They made their choice. And they would have to live with the consequences of it. And the same is true in our lives. You can bow before Him in worship and receive the blessing of eternal life, or you can bow before Him in judgment later. But that's it. So what do you do with Jesus Christ? That's it. How will you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? Let's close with a few points of application. One, see His goodness. See the goodness of God. The God who made the world and everything in it. Just like this man who made a vineyard. He cared for it. He watered it. He tended it. And when men corrupted it, He sent His prophets and He sent His Son Think of the goodness and the kindness of God here. He willingly added flesh to His divine nature to live a sinless life among, sinless, uh, among sinful men, but only to then die in place of those very same sinful men, like me, to redeem us. 
See His goodness here. See His love. Think about His faithfulness and His blessings. Let that flood your heart and your mind this morning. Let that well up with gratitude and joy for who He is and what He's done. Second point of application, respond in faith. Perhaps you're here and you've never acknowledged Christ as Lord. You've held on to this perception of control or ownership in your life. My friend, don't make that mistake. Don't repeat the error that we see these Pharisees make. So many times we look at these guys and we're like, He's, it's right there, you idiots. Don't be fools. Turn and, turn and believe. And then we, we go, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to run me. We do the same thing. Don't repeat the error of the Pharisees. Turn from your sin and trust in Christ. Respond in faith. Repent and believe and worship Christ for what He's done for you. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for this beautiful summary that does not fall short of delivering. Lord, it is an accurate depiction of what You've done to redeem Your people. It's an accurate summary of Your story, of Your plan of establishing a nation and sending a son to die for the sins of the world. Lord, help us to be people who join you in seeing this vineyard be productive, healthy, and fruitful. Lord, not for ourselves, not for our sake, not for our glory, but for you. You are worthy of it. You have every right to tell us how to live and to command us. Lord, and even though time and time again we have rejected you and sinned against you, you keep extending your grace to us. So Lord, I pray that all of us, all of us gathered together this morning, we trust you as Savior. <coughs> Follow you as Lord. We worship you as King. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 I think Frank is in prayer today.